Okay, welcome to our next lecture, section 2.2. On this one, we're going to be focusing on water. We'll also get into pH a little bit. So let's go ahead and get started. So I thought this image was so cute. So why even take a whole section and talk about water? Well, there are several properties that we're going to be focusing on dealing with water. Here's a little bit of a review. It is polar. Um, so if you need to review this a little bit more, um, go ahead and take a look at that. So the oxygen X is a negative end, the hydrogen is positive, and that's really going to cause it to be a magnet so that water can attract or join with other water molecules, and it can also affix two different types of material. So the attraction happens between, the interaction between the water molecules happen between the hydrogen bond of one water molecule and the oxygen of another. So I could keep going off of this and make a pattern, okay? And again, remember that it is a weak bond, so it can break very easily. So here is one water molecule showing covalent bonding between the hydrogen and the oxygen. And here is hydrogen bonding showing between different water molecules, okay? So the properties of water. Um, I'm going to cover these in this order, so you don't need to write all these down first. But we're going to talk about cohesion, surface tension, adhesion, capillary action, universal solvent. And then you'll notice that I changed the font. So everything in bold, cohesion, surface tension, etc., those are the ones you really need to focus on. Uh, you may get into, I'm going to cover a little bit on high specific heat. Uh, it's less dense as a solid, so it's ice and the high heat of vaporization. Okay, so let's talk about cohesion first. And I thought this little diagram in the corner here was really kind of summed it up. Um, basically, it's water molecules that stick to each other. So these are two little water droplets, okay, and they're kind of holding hands. So the attraction is between the particles of the same substance, cohesion, okay? So water to water. So this is going to result in what's called surface tension. So it really makes it like a solid. So that's why if you put something, and this is a paper clip, but any kind of like paper or something, that's why it floats, and that's why you're able to skip a rock across a pond or whatever, okay? It's because of the high surface tension, pulling of those pol polar molecules on one another, and then the hydrogen bonds between them. So here's a little water strider. Okay, it's able to stay on the surface. So it really helps insects walk across the surface, but why is it relevant to, or how is it helpful to people? Well, our bodies are full of cells, and each cell is primarily water. The water is going to dissolve many substances that allows our cells to bring in important nutrients, minerals, and chemicals. So it's that water that's dissolving it, and it makes it so that it can pull it across the substance, okay? So it's that cohesion of the water molecules sticking to one another. So that's cohesion. Adhesion, think of it adhesive when you add glue and you put two different things together. So here's my little water molecule, and this could be a leaf or a glass or whatever. So the water molecules are going to stick or they are attracted to other things. So here's a plant, and here's a little water droplet. Okay, so you can see where it's sticking to the plant. And it's also the droplet is also forming and sticking to itself. So I put some examples up here. These are just a few examples. Now, when you talk about capillary action, this is actually the two working together, adhesive and cohesive. Um, what's a really fun little experiment, let's say you want to have a blue flower, whatever color that you just can't buy. So you can always take food coloring, and so here I have two white roses, and by capillary action, kind of like a straw, it will bring up the color and basically dye your flower. Now, they don't last as long, but you can always dye your So you can always, you know, have different flowers, different colors. Okay, so as the water moves through a plant, so we're talking about from the roots to the leaves, then it's going to act like a straw. So it gives water the ability to climb structures or to climb up plants. Okay, the third is a universal solvent. Okay, we're going to be talking about solvent quite a bit in our labs. 
So water is the solvent for life. So it's able to dissolve many substances. So let's talk about what a solvent is, what a solute is, and what a solution is. So the solvent is what's going to dissolve a solute. Okay, so that would be like you have a pitcher of water, you add Kool-Aid and sugar, the water obviously is the solvent, and then the solutes will be the Kool-Aid and the sugar. So anything that's dissolved in the solvent. So when you mix the two together and I make my Kool-Aid, mix the three things together, then I made a solution. Okay, so here you can see we've got solute and you have sugar, salt, whatever, added to the water. Once I dissolve it, then it becomes a solution. So here's just kind of written as an equation. Okay, so I've already given the example of Kool-Aid. So here's just another example with iced tea. So adding the tea and the sugar with the solvent water. So why is water so good at dissolving things? Well, we're going back to because it's so po because it's polar. Um, and basically, if you look at it, it looks like a wedge and it's able to break those substances into smaller pieces, which enables it to dissolve. So it's basically the shape. Okay, the fourth property of water is a high specific heat. So it's the definition would be the amount of heat, or in this case, energy, needed to either increase or decrease the temperature by one degree Celsius, and that could be anything. So water has a really high specific heat. So what that means, it takes a lot of energy for the water to increase or decrease. So it means that it's absorbing a lot of heat before it starts to basically boil, if you're boiling water, or it takes a lot and pulls a lot of heat if you're freezing water. So that's why you put a pot of water on to make spaghetti, and it could take 15, 20 minutes to heat up the water. It usually takes longer to boil the water than it does to uh, cook the pasta. So, and the reason why is because, again, it's a polar molecule. It has a very strong attraction between the water molecules. Okay, the fifth property is less dense as a solid than a liquid. So, that is because um, of the spacing between it. On the left here, it is a solid. So, it becomes very fixed because it's frozen. The spacing is uniform. A liquid, it's fluid, obviously, but the space between them are always changing. So if I look at the spacing here, it's all irregular and different, and that's because water molecules are breaking and rebonding. And that is why ice can float on water, okay, or icebergs, whatever the case may be. The sixth property is a high heat of vaporization. So this would be my states of matter. I'm sure you've had this before. So it's the amount of energy needed to turn a substance from a liquid to eventually a gas, okay? But I could go solid liquid gas. So if I look at this chart, here's my temperature as it increases, and here's the heat added. So if I put um, an ice cube in a pot, so that would be my A down here. I'm adding heat to it. I'm heating it up, okay? And then when it starts to melt, here's my melting, okay? And then when it's all melted, then I keep adding heat, and then it goes to a liquid, okay? And then once it starts, that point of when it starts to boil, okay, that transition, then when it boils and the little bubbles are popping, then that's the gas until eventually it's all evaporated. And then I can also go down the other direction, condensing, like if I have a glass of iced tea or ice water, on the outside of the glass, the water condenses, um, and then eventually I can get down to freezing, make it a solid again. Okay, so why does water have a high heat of vaporization? And this is because of the hydrogen bonds. Um, it takes a higher heat to break them apart, even though the hydrogen bonds are a weak bond. Okay, it's not that weak. Okay, so we're going to transition into acids and bases and pH, and that's because it's going to deal with the water molecule. So we already know this, that one water molecule is made up of two hydrogen, one oxygen. If I break them apart, let me pull up my other diagram here, uh, breaking apart is called ionization. So I'm making them into ions. So that would be the water molecule here. And I'm going to look at this arrow, okay, on the bottom. And if I break it apart, it's going to make a hydrogen ion, and it will also make a hydroxide ion. Okay, the OH will go together with a negative charge. I can also put them together and make a water molecule. 
So this is going to be important knowing the hydrogen ion and the hydroxide ion because if I have more hydrogen, it's going to be an acid. If I have more hydroxide, it's going to be a base. And we're going to do this in lab, actually. Okay, so what are acids and bases? By definition, an acid is anything that has more hydrogen ions, and the scale goes from 0 up to 6.99. Um, I put that on there going out to the nearest hundredth because our probes read that high. So that would make it an acid or acidic. A base, it has more hydroxide ions, so it's anything above 7.01 to 14. It's basic. It's also called alkaline. So the scale is anything that ranges between 0 and 14, and it's really a percentage of more hydrogen or more hydroxide ions. And pH of 7 is neutral. Now, each pH unit, so that would be the 1, 2, 3, 4, is really a factor of 10 times the change in the concentration. So what does that mean? Okay, so if I have a pH of 3 and I have a pH of 6, we know that 3 is more acidic than 6. But how much more acidic or how stronger? Well, if it's a factor of 10, if I go up from 3 to 6, that's going up 3 factors. Okay, so that would be equivalent to 10 times 10 times 10. So that means that pH of 3 is a thousand times stronger or a thousand times more acidic than a pH of 6. Okay, this will be really important to know when you get to chemistry. So I'm just covering this briefly. I'm not going to ask you to do any calculations, but just know um, how much more acidic it is. Okay, here is a pH scale. I just threw um, on this scale just a few of common substances, to kind of give you an idea where it falls on the scale. I'm not going to ask you specifically what is lemon juice, okay? But I like this, and you can pause because it does show you the increase in hydrogen ions, the decrease or a lowering, a decrease in hydrogen ions. So you can see you can word that either way, okay? Um, so be careful about that when you read the questions. So you may want to take a look at this. So increase basic, lower concentration of pH, or I could say a higher or increase in the hydroxide ions. Okay, buffers, and you'll talk, see a little bit about this in our lab. I'm going to ask you a question about this. A buffer is anything to maintain the pH of a system, okay? So the double arrows means it can go either direction. So on the left here, I have carbonic acid, which is a carbonate. You may have heard that, like uh, carbonated drinks, okay? And then if I break that down, you notice I've got a hydrogen ion, and I also have something called a bicarbonate ion. So this is an ion because it has a negative charge here. Okay, so I get, a buffer is a compound molecule or ion to maintain a pH within a system. And so the body is needing to be in balance at all times. Okay, when it's not, you just don't feel well. And they call that balance, a biological balance, as homeostasis. Okay. So what does the pH have to do with the human body? Well, in our body, there are two natural buffers. There's the carbonate, which was the uh, molecule that we saw on the left, and the bicarbonate, the ion. Okay, And so one example is in our blood. We need to maintain homeostasis in our blood. So if it becomes too acidic, then the body is going to release bicarbonate to help reduce the acidity. If it becomes too alkaline or basic, then the kidneys kick in, and then it's going to release carbonate or carbonic acid, and it's going to bring that level back down to normal. Now, why should we worry about the pH in our body? Well, if it becomes too acidic or too alkaline, then that can start affecting our metabolism, um, our respiratory, even can lead to disease if it persists. Um, if it's too extreme or lasts for too long, you know, you don't take care of it, becomes chronic, it could even lead to death. Um, we do have artificial buffers. So like if you have an upset stomach, what do you usually reach for? You reach for Tums or some kind of antacid. So that reduces the acid in our stomach, which is the hydrogen ions. So those are two examples of natural and artificial buffers. So 
I know I went through this pretty quick. Make sure you know the properties of water. We'll be focusing more on pH in our lab. So take a look through your spiral. Um, again, go to your online textbook, look at section 2.2, add any notes that I did not cover, highlight anything if you choose to. Okay, so I will see you next time.